The Kiss of Satan by Maxwell White, Chapter 1 In the Law of Opposites, it seems that there is a universal law of opposites. One seems to counterbalance the other. If we find a positive, we must expect a negative. Darkness is the absence of light, and when light is manifested it dispels the darkness. In the study of the principles of electricity, we find there is a positive and a negative, and without these two opposite poles there can be no flow of current. A condition of static immobility would result. And when we consider the behavior of alternating current, we find that the positive peak is equal to the negative peak, but the negative component may be rectified or converted and made positive. We can use this as an analogy of the workings in the world of spirits, both holy and unholy. The whole of creation is held together by the Holy Spirit of God. God is the original creator of all matter and spirit and without His eternal being there would be nothing. But matter and spirit are extensions of His mind, for He spoke and it was so and God saw that it was good. In the New Testament, this is taught by Paul in Colossians 1 verse 16 and 17, where we read that all things both physical and spiritual were created by Jesus, the spoken word of God, and they were created for Him, and thereafter are maintained by Him. In Hebrews 11 verse 3 we read that the worlds were framed by the word of God and were made of invisible things. Thus spiritual forces of God created visible matter, and the very composition of these elements in their atomic form is maintained by the Spirit of God alone. The bridge between the tangible and the intangible is real. There is a vital link between matter and spirit. It is impossible to understand the workings in the physical realm without understanding the sustaining force of God, but there is a negative force which interrupts this state of well-being, and this force is also personal. God is the eternal person, but Satan is the opposite, a created person. God creates, Satan destroys. God heals, Satan makes sick. The Bible picture of the Christian Church is a composition of men and women filled with the Holy Spirit and thus receiving blessings of health, strength, joy, and peace. This Church, called the Body of Christ, is to show forth and demonstrate His saving grace to all who are activated by other spirits and to deliver them from the thraldom of these spirits and convert them to faith in Christ, so that they also may be filled with God's Spirit. Using the electrical analogy, God desires to transform the individual from the negative cycle to the positive cycle. The Bible actually uses the word transform, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Romans 12 the power of God completely changes the whole nature of the individual by rectification of the spirit of man through the Holy Spirit. The negative personality becomes positive in action and behavior. The mentally and spiritually bound becomes liberated as a transformation takes place. In the law of opposites, day cannot be fully appreciated unless we have been through the night. We venture to suggest that vigorous health cannot be enjoyed to the fullest without the opposite experience of sickness and disease. The realization of the holiness and greatness of Almighty God cannot be appreciated in the right perspective, unless man is faced with an alternative. Man being a creature of free will is therefore faced with two opposites, good and evil. These are ever around him. He has to make the choice each day. Long ago Joshua challenged God's holy people by saying, Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24 verse 15. The choice here is between God and gods, God, represented to a Christian as the triune God Father, Son and Holy Spirit, or a multiplicity of gods. As the Trinity works in unison, so does Satan and his gods. As God the Father manifests his Son on earth by the Holy Spirit, so does Satan, the prince of this world, manifest his evil powers by his unholy spirits. The image of a heathen god is but the outward symbol of the evil spirit behind it. The real god is not the idol of wood or stone, but the powerful demon inhabiting the idol and its associated worship. The word occult basically means hidden. 
Thus the danger of the occult will be hidden from natural eyes and understanding and can only be revealed by the Spirit of God through the operation of the charismatic gifts. The fact that the spirit world is invisible does not mean it does not exist, in fact, as we have explained, the physical is in fact the manifestation of the spiritual, and where the laws of God are upset, as in the case of breakdown in mental or physical health, we must look for another spirit, an evil spirit, which will be invading and upsetting the perfect balance created by God. God gives us His health, Satan steals it from us and then tells us a lie by saying we have no right to expect to be healthy. He is the father of lies. When Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, he was not rebuking air and water but the spirit behind these elements which Satan was using for destruction. Water is good to drink and to swim in, but not to drown in. The same air we breathe for life can be so whipped up by satanic fury that it can blow our house down and kill us. What matters, then, is the agent behind the storm. Though we cannot see the occult agent, yet we can feel and experience his power in the destructive elements. Deuteronomy 28 clearly gives us the choice of two ways. It contains the law of spiritual opposites and the effects which happen according to our choice. If we obey God then a whole catalogue of blessings are promised in health, work, occupation and farm stock. Blessings overtake us. We do not seek after them, they follow us like the signs enumerated in Mark 16 verse 16 through 18. On the other hand, if we do not obey, then a very long list of curses will automatically follow us. There will be no avoiding them. These curses, the opposite of the blessings, come from Satan through his unholy spirits. The blessings come from God by his Holy Spirit. The natural man with his rationalizations and philosophies will never understand the cause of his problem. It is a cult, that is to say, hidden from view. We pray to God, and the Holy Spirit comes to our aid with ministering angels sent by God. Both the Holy Spirit and the angels are outside the realm of natural understanding or comprehension. If we do not pray to God in faith for help, then we do not release the positive forces of good on our behalf but we maintain a state of unbelief in which the negative forces of evil operate automatically to our hurt and destruction. We can see the evidence of faith or absence of faith, but we cannot see the primary cause which is spiritual. Only with our spiritual eyes shall we see and understand these mysteries. The spirit of an unconverted person is totally dark. It is only when the light of the world, Jesus, shines into our spirits that we become new creatures, and the candle of the Lord is lit within us. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly in Proverbs 20 verse 27, but we also read that, there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out in Proverbs 24 verse 20. In the case of the righteous man, the candle is shining and illuminating the very inner recesses of the personality, but in the case of the disobedient man the candle is put out. The result is total darkness and complete lack of understanding which often leads to early physical death and insanity. When we allow Jesus to shine into our beings and reveal the Word of God to us, then we realize how much darkness there has been. As we turn from darkness to light, conversion takes place. We are transformed. On one side of us there is eternal life and light, on the other is eternal death and darkness. We are in the middle. The decision of which way we go, the broad path that leads to destruction or the narrow way that leads to life Matthew 7 verse 13 and 14, is ours alone. No one can make it for us. Satan ever seeks to capture and blind us by telling us he alone is the angel of light, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, Corinthians 11 verses 14 and 15. Notice that, in this case, Satan, who is a spirit, transforms himself, but we are transformed by an operation of the Holy Spirit. Satan by his demon spirits transforms his own ministers as angels of light to deceive us. 
They appear in many guises but are always controlled by an occult spirit. They can minister in churches claiming to be Unitarian, Modernistic, Theosophic, or any of the Christ-denying cults that deny the efficacy of the blood of Jesus to cleanse. They can be false prophets and false Christs, antichrists as in Matthew 24 verse 24, and they can come as sheep in wolves clothing, but inwardly they are as ravening wolves in Matthew 7 verse 15, and we are told to beware of them. They come as angels of light, as sheep to be accepted of the unwary, but the spirits operating in and through them are demonic and destructive. These are occult spirits. There are men who creep into churches and pray for the sick, and miracles seem to take place, but they are operating in the strength and revelation of the occult spirits and thereby many are deceived. Jesus said, By their fruits ye shall know them. They often put on a false front of love to deceive, and the evil spirit shows in their faces. As someone has described it, it has the appearance of a plastic face, an unreal mask, but challenge them and plead the blood of Jesus and their spirit will soon be revealed for what it is, an occult, deceiving, religious spirit. Beware of false prophets. Chapter 2 Personal Experiences If God intends to use a man in a positive way, he may first give him some education of the negative way. We learn by contrast. As a child I grew up in a nominal Christian home and went regularly to the Scottish Presbyterian Church, but my mother was enmeshed on her side of the family in spiritism and variations of the occult. I was led to understand that the family was really communicating with the human spirits of departed people and that these people desired to get in touch with us through the agency of a medium. My Aunt Esther was such a medium. My eldest uncle, Walter, was a professor at Leeds University in England and was one of the first to practice hypnotism clinically in Leeds Infirmary. Another uncle, Aubrey, was a medical doctor and studied occult practices of various kinds. Uncle Harry claimed to be a pantheist, i.e., one who disavows the personality of God but sees the universe and God as the same thing. Aunt Daisy was a theosophist of high rank, believing in the equality of Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, Jesus Christ, etc., but not in salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can see that our whole family was one big mess of occultism in its various manifestations. They believed in reincarnation, astral planes, and communications with the dead, necromancy. No one except my mother, who later was truly converted, believed that Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. They attended seances, saw trumpets floating around the room, experienced levitation, heard the voices of spirits, enjoyed table rapping, and took part in both spirit writing and spirit drawing. My Aunt Esther used to draw the internal anatomy of humans with uncanny accuracy, and these were checked by both of my uncles who were medical doctors. Mother used to hold a pencil in her hand and watch the controlling spirits write in large writing all kinds of nonsense, and some sense. I was always taught that this proved that life existed after death. Hour after hour I listened as my medium aunt talked incessantly to my mother about these things. I saw spirit photographs, pictures of fairies, and was taught about ectoplasm and the materialization of spirit forms. Let me explain. When a spirit medium is in a deep trance and under the control of the familiar spirit, it is possible for this spirit to take some of the physical matter of the medium's body and use it to materialize a form, sometimes the face of the departed person. Recently a man told me that he had been to a trumpet seance. As the speaking trumpets would sail round the room, he asked the spirit if he might shake hands, so the spirit offered the trumpet as a hand. This man told me that he insisted on shaking hands with the spirit purporting to be the spirit of a departed person. Immediately this man felt three clammy cold fingers of ectoplasm in his hand which he described as dead cow's udders. He was disgusted. I was familiar with clairvoyance, psychometry and all the paraphernalia that goes with the occult. As a child of twelve I took part in the experiment of a heavy dining room table walking up the wall of my grandfather's house in Beckenham, Kent, England. I have heard my uncle speaking to the spirits, 
who replied with one knock for yes and two knocks for no, a kind of demonic urim and thummim. I have seen them using the Ouija board, or planchette, and the spirit behind the board would spell out their answers. Today a whole generation of our young people can purchase these Ouija boards and play with them for kicks and not realizing the danger involved. When I was a young man, one of my friends who, like myself, had recently got married was encouraged by a third friend to try spirit writing. My friend, coming from a God-fearing Anglican home, knew nothing of this at all. He simply took a pencil, waited, and the spirit began to take control and started writing. Various questions were asked, such as, Who are you? To which the spirit replied by writing the name of an Italian. My friend Don had never heard of this name before, but he went with his wife to the library to check, and sure enough, it was the name of a 16th-century Italian painter. He was immediately afraid and dropped the practice. But how could this spirit know about this Italian painter? Could it indeed have been the actual human spirit of the artist? No, it was a demon spirit that had lived in the mind and body of the artist and knew his intimate, evil life. Demons do not die, they do not sleep. They wander naked seeking the house of another body through whom they desire to manifest their evil nature and characteristics. All we have to do is open the door to them. The door of occultism in any form is that which they seek. No wonder Paul said, Give no place to the devil, Ephesians 4 verse 27. I have seen my uncles and aunts put their fingers under the armpits of another person and lift. By levitation of the spirit's human bodies are lifted. In cases of spiritist experts the mediums can be lifted right up to the ceiling by the spirits. Objects in haunted houses can suddenly sail across the room to be dashed senselessly against the wall. It is easy to say, I don't believe these things. Did not Paul speak of unbelief when he wrote, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In Romans 3 verse 3. This scripture, of course, applies strictly to belief in the works of the Holy Spirit, but as we are trying to show that we learn by contrasts, many who refuse to believe in God also refuse to believe in the negative supernatural of Satan and his demons. Many who investigate the evidence of both the Holy Spirit in healings, miracles, tongues, prophecy, etc. and the supernatural happenings in the occult, cannot explain these things at all. So they try to make a science of it and create university courses called parapsychology, where young people are led to study the workings of demons. Many young people become enmeshed in dangerous occult practices by such studies. In my own family, disaster has struck time and time again. Without mentioning names, there has been adultery and sudden deaths among my cousins. Husbands have left wives with children, and then to seek solace, they have gone to false cult religions instead of to Jesus who heals, forgives, and cleanses by his blood. Marriages have broken up, and one in particular has become a wastrel and an immoral man. The mark of Cain is on the family. We cannot play with sin and escape contamination. There is no doubt in my mind that everyone, who has in times past been contaminated by occultism in any form, has also been polluted by evil spirits, either in their minds or bodies. The effect seems to be cumulative, and the older the person, the more the evil spirits dig down deep into the personality, binding and destroying like a spiritual cancer. Senility may often be traced to occult involvement in times past or in the history of our parents. Cancer and other foul diseases may also be traced. There seems to be an occult line which is very tenacious and has to be confessed, forsaken and forgiven before it can be broken by the prayer of faith given in the name of Jesus. When I first sought the baptism in the Holy Spirit in 1939, I knew nothing of these things. My friends urged me to plead the blood of Jesus, but I refused. I could not. They joyously did so, and of course the effect was immediate. I stiffened out like a board from a kneeling position and fell flat on my face, wondering what was happening. It was years later when I realized that, at that moment, 
an evil spirit of occult contamination had left me, by the honouring of the blood of Jesus. It was cast out of me by the power of God that answered to the cry of the blood. Satan is always defeated by any mention of the blood of Jesus whether in song or prayer. A week later I went to another seeking meeting, as they were called then, and was quickly filled with the Holy Spirit, because this time I was freely able to plead the blood. I heard myself begin to speak in a heavenly language as the Holy Spirit came in. The occult spirit had gone out. My mother was a great student of the writings and prophecies of Johanna Southcott, a last-century medium. She made many false prophecies which were published and which led to the forming of a society. We pleaded with her to burn them, but she said she had been helped so much by these writings that she refused to destroy them. Although she followed me into the truths of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and received an experience of speaking in tongues, she never had too much liberty. When I first started telling her about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially the true gift of prophecy, she said, I know all about these things. What she really meant was that she was familiar with Satan's counterfeits. She was unable to discern the true from the false. So many people in our historic churches are unable to understand that healings are indeed practiced in spiritist churches with messages, and that when they hear of gifts of healing being practiced in New Testament churches which honor the blood of Jesus, they think of all supernatural happenings as coming from the same source, God. Tongues, interpretation and prophecy are what they have in seances. Satan is a good counterfeiter. So many in Spiritism say that the evidence of the supernatural and the friendliness of the people have drawn them closer to God, and they are not willing to depart from their spiritual harlotry. Chapter 3 The Appearance of Samuel In 1 Samuel 28 verse 7 to 25, we have an amazing story of Spiritism at its worst. The Witch of Ender had a familiar spirit, that is to say, she was possessed and motivated by an evil spirit who divined messages from the unseen occult state. The demon spirits in her, in favorable circumstances such as a trance, would communicate their thoughts through the mouth of the human witch. It is strongly emphasized among spiritists, who now claim the title Christian spiritualists, that this account is a classic case of a medium bringing Samuel back out of the unseen state, and that the whole story illustrates the truth, that it is possible not only to communicate with dead persons but also to see them in bodily manifestation. The wording of the scripture would seem to bear this out. Saul said to the witch, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? to bring me up. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? If Samuel really did appear and speak to Saul, then the laws of God would have been set aside. God would have contradicted what he had already said and spoken through Samuel when he was alive. This is an impossible contradiction. In 1 Samuel 28 verse 6 we read that Saul inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him not. The three major means whereby God would speak to Saul were closed, dreams in the night to his spirit, Urim and Thummim in the breastplate of the high priest, and the voice of his prophets. Saul was literally cut off from God and all means of communication with him. In desperation he sought another means forbidden by God, a voice from the pit. It was an absolute impossibility that God would speak to him, and we will endeavor to prove this. In the law we read, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards, to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people, Leviticus 20 verse 6. The law was clear. Saul disobeyed it, therefore in going to a woman who had a familiar spirit or demon, he received the reply of that demon, because all communication with God by his Holy Spirit was severed. Saul himself was no longer considered a child of God, and he was cut off from among his own Israelite people. As we read later, Jesus spoke of a branch of the vine being pruned or cut off the tree, 
it then died and was burned in John 15. This was the inexorable fate of King Saul. It was not Samuel who spoke to Saul, it was a demon spirit impersonating Samuel, and this spirit could be materialized since this possibility exists even in advanced spiritism. The witch of Ender was a very powerful medium. Saul confessed to the demon impersonating Samuel that God would not speak to him any more, either by dreams or prophets. How then could this be a prophet speaking to Saul when he already confessed that the voice of the prophets was silent? It could only be an impersonator. This seems to be made very clear in the final account of the tragic death of King Saul. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit, to inquire of it. And inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him, 1 Chronicles 10 verses 13 and 14. The reason for his untimely death was because he inquired of an evil spirit. God would not have allowed him to die if he had inquired of God. It is clearly stated that the communication was with a demon spirit, because all communication with God by the Holy Spirit had been completely and finally severed. Saul did not speak to Samuel. He spoke to an evil occult spirit impersonating Samuel, and God had no alternative under the dispensation of the law but to cause his judgment to operate. Saul died. It is very important to remember that Saul did not seek the Lord, he went to seek a woman that had a familiar spirit in 1 Samuel 28 verse 7. Saul had already sought the Lord but only received silence. The ministry of Samuel was to be a prophet, a mouthpiece of God. God spoke to Saul and others through Samuel. No other voice came through him because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Peter makes it clear that the ancient prophets spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost in 2 Peter 1 verse 21. Even when Balaam tried to prophesy for financial gain, the only words that came out of his mouth were from the Holy Ghost. Assuming that Saul did indeed see and talk to Samuel in the witch's home, no words would have come out of his mouth, for God had already shown that he would never speak to Saul again by a prophet. The genuine Samuel would have been silent like his God. All that Saul hoped to gain was supernatural information from a source other than God, therefore, he went to inquire of a familiar spirit, which is specifically mentioned as one of the sins of Israel in Isaiah 8 verse 19, where inquiring of the dead by the agency of familiar spirits is contrasted with seeking after God. It seems we have the other side of the prophetic coin here. One side enables us to communicate with God by His Holy Spirit, and the other with evil spirits simulating the dead. When the witch was using her occult powers, she was alarmed when she saw what appeared to be Samuel, plus other spirits referred to as gods ascending from the earth. We have already explained that when God commands us not to serve other gods, he had in mind that we should not serve the demons behind the idols of the heathen. The first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before or instead of me, is immediately followed by the second commandment which is a logical corollary of the first, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, Exodus 20 verses 3 and 4. It is impossible to worship an unseen occult spirit without some visible manifestation to represent the deity behind that image. This is why some idols are so hideous, especially in China, for the worshippers have actually seen the appearance of the gods they worship. Witch doctors, swamis, holy men and high priests are merely the mediums through whom the demons manifest themselves. All heathen religions of any form are of the occult. It is unfortunate that the practice of making holy images crept into the church at the time of Constantine, when he forced everyone of note in the pagan Roman Empire to be baptized by decree to become Christians. The heathen naturally brought their visible gods into the church. Their names were changed to those of saints. There is a good reason why the Bible teaches us that no man has ever seen God. He is the invisible God and the only way we are going to see Him is by seeing the Son in John 14 verse 9. 
Jesus is the express image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15, and no stone or wooden statue will portray God Almighty. It is said that Moses had to destroy the brazen serpent which had been put up on a pole, because after people were healed by looking on it, for it typified Christ it became an idol worshipped by the Israelites. As soon as we start to worship the creation rather than the Creator, we are into the world of the occult, Romans 1 verse 21 to 25. In Deuteronomy 18 verse 11 one of the forbidden practices was that of consulting with familiar spirits. As we have said, Saul had no intention of consulting with God. His intention was clear, he sought out a witch with a familiar spirit. The evil spirit impersonating Samuel would of course have known Samuel's way of life and many details that occurred in his life. Where demons appear in spiritist seances and communicate messages, it is highly probable that they actually lived in the departed person, and so could of course actually speak the language and accent of that person. We are not suggesting that this was so in the case of Samuel. He was a servant of God and therefore a much feared enemy of Satan. No doubt Satan and his demons had watched his every move for many years. Given the right circumstances demons can speak in other languages as well as prophesy through spiritist mediums. These demons will prophesy through false prophets, right in our churches, and in Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 to 3 we read that their instructions would be that, we should serve other gods. God permits these poor deluded souls to be in our midst, for He said that He wants to prove us to know whether we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul. Here we get the contrast approach, learning the positive from the negative. If we never hear a false prophecy or come into contact with a false prophet, then how shall we recognize the true one? The spirits that inhabit these prophets are called lying spirits in the Bible, and we are counseled to test the spirits whether they are of God. Beloved, believe in not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4 verse 1. Any prophecy that detracts from Jesus and advertises man is the utterance of a demon. The Holy Spirit is only sent to glorify Jesus. John 16 verse 14. Saul came under the bondage of a lying spirit after he rebelled against God, and this spirit obviously enticed him to go to the witch. Having identified the demon spirit that personified Samuel, we then find that he gave himself away to Saul. The final message that he gave was, Tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me, 1 Samuel 28 verse 19. The spirit had been brought up by the witch out of the pit called Sheol, or the place of departed spirits. Samuel was in Abraham's bosom, not in torment but at rest, and nothing would disturb his sweet rest in the abode of the righteous dead. There is a great gulf fixed between these two places, as we read in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, but the rich man died, was buried, and went to hell. Luke 16 verse 19 to 26. If we wish to enter into the eternal state of bliss, we must cross over the bridge of this great gulf by accepting the sacrifice of Jesus. And we must do this now. After death it is too late. Any teaching which is contrary to this simple truth is out of the pit, from a seducing spirit, and is a doctrine of demons, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. There are many specious cults that deny the simple truths of the duality of the gospel. Universalism, for example, teaches that all go to heaven ultimately. This is the teaching of an occult spirit. The only known case of a man being brought back from Abraham's bosom was that of Moses, who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17 verse 1 to 18. We are distinctly told, however, that this was an act of God, not of a demonized witch or wizard. God is omnipotent and can do as He wills. If we try to imitate Him by interfering with the underground world of demons, we shall be cut off and probably die before our time in sickness or mental disease. In praying for the sick today we have been amazed at the number who have been engaged in some forbidden occult practice in past times. If we give our minds and bodies to these cruel spirits, they will take the place we give them, 
will refuse to leave, and will multiply in our minds and bodies like germs. They have to be confessed, forsaken, and cast out in the name of Jesus before any release and healing can take place. Chapter 4 Occult Practices In Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 we have a command forbidding the heathen practice of making sons or daughters to pass through fire. Some interpret this as the human sacrifice practiced in some heathen religions as mentioned in Deuteronomy 12 verse 31, for even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. The command in Deuteronomy 18 verse 10, however, refers to going through fire, and coming out unharmed. In a most interesting book by Doris Irvine of Bristol, England, called From Witchcraft to Christ, she tells how she achieved the great distinction of actually walking into a great fire on Dartmoor in England during a great conclave of European witches and warlocks. Miss Irvine testified that when she was actually in the fire, Satan himself would be there, would hold out his hand to her and see her safely through. This actually happened as she foretold, and she was promoted to Queen of Witches for Europe for one year. She suffered no harm in the fire and even the smell of smoke was not on her black witch's gown. Doris Irvine was saved during evangelist Eric Hutchings' campaign and was later delivered from the occult demons through the ministry of a Baptist minister in the west of England. We knew of the case of a spirit-filled minister who went to Indonesia, and while watching heathen witch doctors walk on live hot coals and stones, was challenged to do the same in the power of his God. He accepted the challenge and actually walked on hot stones with no harmful results. We feel that this was unwise and was presuming on God's goodness, for we are told not to tempt God. His protections operate for us, as in the case of the three Hebrew youths who were thrown into the fiery furnace because of their testimony. They declared that God would deliver them, and He did, without the smell of smoke on their garments. We see here the positive and negative principle again. Both Satan and God can protect in fire. In like manner, God promises that if we drink poison we shall not be harmed, but we must not tempt God by experimenting. Similarly, in Mark 16 verse 18, believers are told that they can take up serpents without harm, but this should not be done deliberately to prove God and tempt Him. Many have died in so doing. Serpents typify Satan and his demons, and we are supposed to keep as far away from them and their spells as we can. When a viper bit Paul on the back of his hand on the island of Malta, he shook it off back into the fire and never gave it another thought. He knew about God's protection, Acts 28 verse 3 to 5. We understand that it is possible for a person to be so hypnotized and put into a trance that a surgeon can perform an operation without using an anesthetic. We have even heard of demon-possessed warlocks operating on a human body without the incision of a knife, and then closing up the wound with no scar remaining. This may sound like a very tall story, and we cannot prove it, but we have read that it does happen in certain heathen cultures. There are areas of the occult that are terrifying without a knowledge of the protection of the blood of Jesus. When heathen priests have their ritualistic orgies working themselves into a frenzy, and inviting demons into their lives, they can freely demonstrate their ability to walk in fire, live coals and hot stones. This is done in India, Indonesia, Africa and dark areas of the world, and proves that the power of spirit is stronger than matter. It also shows us by contrast the incredible power of the Holy Spirit to keep us from harm if we abide in the secret place of the Most High. The promise is that no evil shall befall us, and the angels of God will have charge over us to keep us in all our ways. We shall tread on the lion and the adder, just as Jesus assures us in the New Testament, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, Luke 10 verse 19. The trouble with us is that we find it easier to run than to tread. But the promise still stands. In India the heathen priests and holy men compete in their ability to lie on beds of nails or to drag carts with hooks in the flesh of their backs with no sign of blood. Spears are put through their flesh and spikes through their noses, yet no blood appears and no pain is felt. Why is this? They have given over their bodies to the power of Satan, 
and he works these miracles to show them his great power. They know nothing of the greater power of Jesus or the cleansing power of his blood. How much more, if we give our minds and bodies to the Lord Jesus Christ, will he keep us from harm and danger? Also mentioned in Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 is the black art of divination. This is mystic insight into the future in its many forms such as reading palms, reading tarot cards or teacups, or crystal ball gazing. It can include water or mineral divining by rod or twig over land or maps. A good illustration of this is the well-known case of the young girl in Acts 16 verse 16 to 18 who had a spirit of divination. She was a young witch and prophesied correctly that Paul and his friends were servants of the Most High God. This was true and Satan knew it. Satan will advertise God if it is for his own ends. Paul took dominion over this spirit of divination and cast it out. Simon Magus in Acts 8 was another who was so well known in Samaria for his satanic miracles that he was known as the great power of God. There is a man called Harry Edwards in London, England, who can fill the Royal Albert Hall with 7,000 people and can heal and do miracles, but he openly admits that his power is from the spirit world. A miracle is a sign of a spirit working, but not necessarily the Holy Spirit. Again we see the principle of the negative in contrast to the positive. If anyone tries to get their fortune told, they are automatically entering into the world of spirits and are attracting demonic power and ability to themselves. Their minds receive the messages given by these demons. In many cases these messages seem nonsensible, but at other times surprising shafts of truth come through. Demons cannot foretell the future, this belongs alone to God, the Great I Am. But demons are very intelligent and make some surprising deductions from known facts in fortune-telling. Let me say right here that it is even dangerous to ask a Holy Spirit-filled person to prophesy over you, for this reduces the gifts of the Spirit to private fortune-telling, and however sincere the child of God may be, they may attract to themselves another spirit if they disobey God in the proper use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit which are for the edification of the Church, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 12. It is a different matter if God by the Spirit reveals something to a minister of the Lord. Many times God uses a person for the ultimate blessing of a brother or sister. This often happens in healing lines where the sick are being prayed for. The revelation is not sought after. It is a word of knowledge given by God. The elders of Moab and Midian approached Balaam with the reward of divination, Numbers 22 verse 7. They were not interested in a pure word of prophecy. They wanted an occult spirit to put a curse on Israel. Balaam tried so hard to earn this fortune-telling money, but the Spirit of God would not respond, and so Balaam gave a blessing instead. A fortune teller will usually ask a price. Because of Israel's refusal to obey the law we read that they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and used divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them out of his sight, 2 Kings 17 verses 17 and 18. Ten tribes were banished from God's presence into the hands of the cruel Assyrians because they preferred to practice occultism for gain, rather than to serve the Lord for blessing. Do we not see this across the world again in our day? Why should any of God's people prefer witchcraft to God? It is because of the kicks. Fire walking and fortune telling can be very entertaining, but Satan has the last kick. We shall get kicked out. When the Ark of the Covenant had been in the land of the Philistines for seven months, the Philistines brought in the diviners to ask their advice in getting it back. 1 Samuel 6 verses 1-2 Is this not the same among some of the priests of our old-line denominational churches who encourage spiritistic practices and give their Sunday school children Ouija boards to play with? The priests of Israel thought God had let them down when He punished them. No doubt King Saul did also. They went to the negative source for information. They offered the opinion that maybe a chance would happen to them, 1 Samuel 6 verse 9. 
the very wording of their pronouncements was not of God. We don't get lucky chances with God. We get positive blessings if we believe. There were plenty of false prophets in Israel who prophesied lying pronouncements. They were fortune tellers. And we have them today. Chapter 5 Delusions In May, 1973, a young teenage girl in Ontario was held for the slaying of a person with a butcher knife in a ritualistic slaying. Her cult in California demanded a human blood sacrifice, although the sacrifices of animals are quite common among Satanist cults. Usually some of the blood is mixed with human blood obtained from incisions in the arm and then is drunk. We see a most revolting opposite of using blood in their sacrificial offerings as compared to the blood of Jesus Christ which he offered for the sins of the world on the cross, and which we may use by faith and drink in the communion service. Before any young person arrives at the rite of drinking blood in a black mass, he will first be introduced to drugs in varying forms, because it is while the human mind is thus exposed that demons enter in and stay. The more a person subjects himself to drugs, the more the demons take over progressive control of the mind, until the spirits become the dominant factor in the human behavior pattern. Thus any kind of atrocious crime can be committed, because the motivating force will be demonic and not human. Demons seek bodies in which their evil nature can be manifested. I admit that this seems quite an impossible truth for the intellectually wise to face up to, but owing to the terrible growth of occultism in our society, especially in high schools, people are being forced to notice something which they have previously screened from their minds. As I am writing this I have a letter from some people in California who tell me that they have been forced into a ministry of deliverance. They did not seek it, neither did they want it, because, they explained, it was too controversial. Young people came to them for help, so when they prayed for them in the name of Jesus, demons would start manifesting themselves by speaking, arguing, and then being violently ejected through the throat. When God called me into this ministry back in 1947, I was not looking for demons. I was trying to help people and was not really aware that the cause of their troubles might be demons. In fact, I honestly knew nothing about evil spirits. Since those days literally thousands have been set free by a commanding prayer given in Jesus' name and the efficacy of His precious blood claimed against these terrible destructive personalities. Our modern civilization is being forced to take note that things are happening today of which no previous generation had had detailed knowledge. We have buried our heads in the sand, or preached that these things could be swept under the rug of parapsychology. No one really understood the meaning of the word. The Bible tells us the whole sordid story. To play with any form of occultism will force you into the hands of evil demonic forces from which you will not be able to extricate yourself. God will cut you off from his protection and Satan will progressively bind your mind and body until you die. Some do this in the guise of a religion that helps them. Oh, the pity of it all! Again referring to Deuteronomy 18, the next category on the list for consideration is the observer of times. Manasseh, king of Judah, was one who consulted with familiar spirits and observed times. God said, I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wiped the dish, wiping it, and turning it upside down. The king led the people into sin, and had there been newspapers, radio and television in those days, they would have had horoscopes, fortune-telling columns, charts of the heavens, and zodiac symbol charms. These things would have been done by the king and people in direct rebellion against the known laws of God. Is it any wonder that Canada, the United States and other freedom-loving nations are suffering such terrible happenings? Is it any wonder that we finally have to face up to the unpalatable fact that the politics of these countries is basically rotten? A rotten politician represents a rotten people until both grow tired of their rottenness. It is then that God promises to sprinkle clean water upon us, Ezekiel 36 verse 25. This cleansing from on high is overdue, but it is coming. Without a spiritual renewal these nations would be wiped clean like a plate. Do we not sweep up garbage and burn or bury it? 
What will God do with the pornography and the mental and spiritual garbage in America today? If he leaves it too long the whole nation would be irredeemably polluted with mental and physical sickness. An observer of times is a prognosticator, one who attempts to foretell future events by means of supernatural powers, for the purpose of gain. Some people will not even plan their day without consulting their horoscopes. They arrange their marriage day and business appointments by observing times. Thank God that we read, our times are in His hands, this means that as He is the Eternal I Am, we do not have to observe times, but just trust Him at all times. Jesus said, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Matthew 6 verse 34. Another evil practice mentioned in Deuteronomy 18 is the art of enchantment. This is the practice of magical arts by magicians. We have a wonderful contrast between the real power of God and the enchantments of Jans and Jambers in Pharaoh's court. Pharaoh was not amazed when God's man, Moses, threw his rod to the ground and it was instantly changed into a writhing serpent. He called for his own wise men, sorcerers, magicians, and these highly paid false prophets and religious leaders of Egypt used their enchantments. They cast down their rods and each rod became a small serpent. Now how did they do this? It is obvious to all Christians that God can do any miracle and create matter for His own purposes, but can magicians do this? No, but they can counterfeit the miracle-working power of God. Demons were dispatched to the desert at lightning speed by the satanic powers working with these men, and exchanged serpents from the desert rocks for the priests' sticks. This is levitation as used in spiritist seances. As glasses and other objects can be made to sail across a room, so were serpents supernaturally transported into Pharaoh's court, and Pharaoh had no doubt that the magicians could do such a trick. It was in fact a demonic sleight of hand. But God showed his superior power because Moses' serpent swallowed up the lesser serpents. The same magicians made water appear as blood, in Exodus 7 and made frogs appear all over the land of Egypt. They counterfeited God's miracles, but when Moses came to the fourth plague of lice on the land, it is written, and the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not, Exodus 8 verse 18. Satan's power, though great and fascinating to the unwary, is yet limited before God's ultimate power and judgments. In Isaiah 47 verse 9 to 11, we have a sad account of God's ultimate judgments descending upon a rebellious people. The basic cause of the terrible punishment was because of their multitude of sorceries and for the great abundance of enchantments. The result was loss of children and widowhood which came upon them suddenly. How often punishments and blessings come suddenly! On the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came suddenly and they spoke in other languages, much to their astonishment. This present renewal of the Church is uncovering many incredible hidden truths and practices, both good and bad. Blessings and curses in abundance. Which do you want? So many play with the occult just for kicks. They are storing up God's judgments to be suddenly visited upon them in suffering, sickness or sorrow, and when it happens we say, wasn't I unlucky? The ancient Egyptian goddess of good fortune was named Luk, from which the word luck is derived. Yes, we do get what these gods give us. We get what we deserve. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, 1 Samuel 15 verse 23. Play with witchcraft and you get the curse of witchcraft. A few years ago there was an article in Reader's Digest about a famous French spiritist who was levitated from his chair in a sitting position to the ceiling where he remained suspended in air without visible means of support or suspension. How? This is an enchantment. If two persons put two fingers under the armpits of a consenting person, they can lift him easily. How? The demons in each case lend their strength and do the levitation. Nebuchadnezzar also had magicians in his court. It was the normal heathen practice. These wise men were the mystics, the prophets of heathendom. 
Daniel and his three friends, however, were the real prophets of God in a heathen setting. They were the positive of the negative. It was written of them, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm, Daniel 1 verse 17 to 20. It is instinctive in man to want to know the future, and God has provided his people with true prophets and teachers. He has given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit, including prophecy, the word of wisdom and knowledge, and the gift of interpretation. Interpretation Why do people need to go to Satan instead of to God? Isaiah tells us why. It is because there is no light in them in Isaiah 8 verse 20. If we walk in darkness, we grope in darkness and hear nothing except empty demonic pronouncements. Much of the church in times past has been spiritually dead and sterile. It has had little to offer in the way of the supernatural, and so Satan has won an easy victory with many who have sought the mystical among the demons. But the whole pattern is changing. God is switching on the light of the Spirit upon the church in our day, and many are beginning to awaken and understand. Should not a people seek unto their God? Instead of the living to the dead? Isaiah 8, 19. Chapter 6. Witches and Warlocks. The term which is usually applied to females, whereas a male is a wizard or a warlock. Their ministry of evil is the same. So serious did God consider this demonic practice that his law was that a witch should be put to death. Exodus 22, 18. This law was not carried out strictly, because King Saul was able to consult with a witch. She was afraid when she realized who he was because she thought he had come to put her to death. He promised her life in direct contradiction to God's word. Witch doctors in Africa are demon-possessed practitioners and are, in fact, practicing mediums. By rites and incantations, they are supposed to heal the sick and put curses on people. Those who are cursed often die, for the familiar spirit kills them. When sickness leaves a person, through the incantations of a witch doctor, it is not cast out as when a Christian prays in Jesus' name to cast out a demon. It is simply removed temporarily from the part of the body that is affected. It is usually driven deeper into the inner personality only to reappear at a later time as a worse sickness of the mind or body, or to return to its original form. Deliverance in Jesus' name is much different. In many cases where spirits of infirmity are rebuked in Jesus' name, the spirits move around, and the person claims to feel their presence, pressure, or pain in various parts of the body, until they ultimately leave, often through the throat with a cough or cry. A medical doctor recently examined the strange rites and results of which doctors in Africa and reported that healings did indeed take place, not only of the body but also of disturbed minds. This doctor claimed that they were doing a good work among their native tribes and should be encouraged to continue, especially where the medical services were lacking. In Africa today reports are coming in from many countries that witch doctors are turning to Christ, burning their fetishes and jujus, and being delivered of their familiar spirits. In Nigeria, I learned firsthand, that witch doctors, who used to be so greatly feared by the primitive peoples are now in turn fearing the native spirit-filled ministers who are proliferating in the present charismatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In more sophisticated countries, however, we do not have witch doctors, but we have the more refined hypnotist. Briefly, one who practices hypnotism is a witch. What actually happens is that the familiar spirits controlling the hypnotist take over the mind of the person being hypnotized. Of course, the patient must be willing to be hypnotized, otherwise, it doesn't work. He must surrender his mind and will utterly to the hypnotist. It is not a question of one mind controlling another, or of one mind being stronger, it is simply a manifestation of a powerful, familiar, evil spirit taking over the subjected mind of the patient, who is temporarily forced into a trance-like state. The spirit invades the victim. In hypnotism, 
it is possible to hypnotize oneself, and the familiar spirit then reveals hidden secrets that may have been forgotten by the mind, but which are resident in the mind nevertheless. One goes into a trance and the evil spirits will speak. The classic case in recent times was Edgar Casey of Virginia Beach, Virginia, who diagnosed sickness in others by the evil spirit within him as he was in a deep trance. In church circles, there is a more subtle form of witchcraft. This concerns the false prophet with false occult gifts. They creep into churches manifesting the supernatural, but they are healing by the spirits and not by the Holy Spirit. They preach a very light message with very little scriptural backing, and then healings occur which charm the people literally, and they conclude he must be a man of God. He is in reality a wizard. This is a religious spirit and when cast out has been known to reveal itself as a spirit of witchcraft. I heard one friend who is a pastor explaining that their faces seem to have a, a plastic look, and this exactly describes their mask-like, unnatural, unholy look. It reveals the seducing spirit inside. It is fake and it simulates the things of God by counterfeit. The classic case, of course, is Simon the Sorcerer in Acts 8, 9-11. He used sorcery in Samaria to bewitch, because he was a witch the people, and stated by self-advertisement that he was a great one. Because of the healings, all the people readily agreed that he was the great power of God. It is stated that he bewitched them all for a long time with his sorceries. Simon was astonished when one greater than he came to the city, Philip the Evangelist. He manifested the gift of miracles and healings, and Simon knew at once that Philip had superior power and tried to buy it with money. The whole occult realm relies upon money, from the greased palm of the palmist to the charges made by practitioners of the bloodless cults. On the island of Paphos, Paul and Barnabas received a visit from a Roman deputy named Sergius Paulus, who was described as a prudent man. He inquired about the way of salvation. In the same place was a sorcerer whose name was Bar-Jesus, which means son of Joshua. Here was a son of Joshua, surely he would rejoice at Sergius Paulus coming to Paul and Barnabas to inquire about Jesus. Not so. Although he had such a fine spiritual name, he was a warlock who operated by other spirits and withstood the men of God. This is one of the great signs of a false prophet today. They withstand the obvious truths of the Word of God, especially those that deal with the whole salvation purchased by Jesus for all mankind, and substitute their religious formulas. However, they claim to represent Jesus. When Elimas for that was bar Jesus' other name, started his negative opposition, Paul looked hard at him and said to this supposed man of God, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. Then the deputy when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Acts 13, 6-12 What a remarkable story! His blindness was caused by his activity in witchcraft, but the judgment brought salvation to another man. Who can tell how many sicknesses are the direct or indirect result of occult involvement in the family? Did Paul make Bar-Jesus blind? No. Paul knew by a word of knowledge received from the indwelling Holy Spirit that this would happen. In the same manner, Peter did not cause the death of Ananias or his wife in Acts 5, 1 to 10. He simply spoke the word of God with boldness and God did the rest. Those who tangle with demonic activities today, even if it be disguised in a Christian garb, may well tremble at what God will do today as the word of God is again preached in the power of the Spirit and confirmed by signs, wonders, and miracles. We read that the demons believe in God and tremble in James 2 verse 19. No wonder which doctors are now trembling in Africa at the outpouring of the Spirit and the preaching of the Word of God. I have seen demon-possessed men and women cry out when they have seen me, don't you touch me, 
and they have been visibly trembling with terror written all over their faces. We have nothing to fear, Psalm 27, but Satan has everything to fear. No wonder we read that Jesus will destroy that wicked by the brightness of his coming, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. This is the day of the reappearing of the Word of God in the power of the Spirit, who will consume the wickedness of occultism and destroy those who tangle with it. At the same time, His mercy is extended to all who will confess, forsake, and ask forgiveness for their wicked ways. Hell was not prepared for humans, but for the devil and all his angels, including the whole occult family. Matthew 25, 41 Now, let me say just a word about the evil eye. Paul was well aware of the subtle dangers surrounding the early Christians. He wrote to the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, Galatians 3 verse 1. The Greek word for bewitched is biskeno, which means literally to smite with the eye. This is an occult practice similar to hypnotism and referred to in the Bible as an evil eye. As Paul, filled with the Spirit, bore his eyes into Elimas and brought blindness, so likewise the eye of a witch or warlock can bore into the very soul of an unsuspecting gullible person and bring a curse into their lives. False prophets when praying for the sick will literally bore their eyes right through a person, and that person will often fall to the ground supposedly under the power of God. This must not be confused with the laying on of hands by Spirit-filled servants of God, which may cause a person to collapse because of the jolt of the Spirit. The Galatians were suffering from the operation of some false prophet who had a seducing spirit, and as he talked to them, he would bore them through and through with his eyes and bring them into a state of spiritual subjection. His seducing spirit would then take over, as in the case of hypnotism, and destroy the pure doctrine of God. Much hypnotism is done by the use of the evil eye. It is often very easy to detect demon-possessed people by the narrow pupils of their eyes. They seem to have a hypnotic effect. This same narrowing takes place when a person is under the influence of drugs. A demon has entered, and even if the drug addict turns to Christ, it may still have to be exorcised from them. Today we must do what John told us, to try the spirits, whether they are of God, 1 John 4, 1. We must not let any false prophet lay hands on us, for he might impart a wrong spirit. We must not let him look into our eyes. We must have nothing whatever to do with him. John says that if any of them, whom he describes as antichrists or false Christs, come to our door, we must not let them into our household. 2 John, 4-10 They do not come advertising themselves as false prophets, but as true ones. The burden is on us to prove them. Chapter 7 the dangers of occultism. A few years ago I received a letter from the brother of an old friend in England. He wrote inquiring about our healing ministry. I wrote him, sending a tract which I had written entitled Divine Healing, and explained that we laid on hands, prayed in the name of Jesus, and pleaded the precious blood of Jesus for healing and cleansing. He wrote back saying that he had been quite interested in what I had to tell him, but he did not understand what I meant when I referred to the Holy Spirit, for he prayed and asked the spirits, whom he called angels, to help him get well. He also failed to see why we had to use the blood of Jesus. This made no sense to him at all. This was obviously a case of spiritism. I wrote and told him so and warned him of the great dangers. He replied that he was a Christian spiritualist and he believed God healed, even as I did. It seems that it was just our approach that was different. He sent me a tape to listen to. For a while, I forgot about it, but some months later found it and decided I ought to listen to see what more he had to say about his version of spiritual or faith healing. He explained how he ministered healing. The spirits, the angels, did the healing while he went into a trance. He said that on the reverse side of the tape I would hear his voice change as the spirit took control. This should have been enough for me, but curiosity got the better of my knowledge of the dangers, so I listened to the whole tape. While listening I had a horrible feeling of evil, 
although I was playing the tape in our church. Within two weeks I was stricken with a very bad attack of bronchitis, which bordered on bronchial pneumonia. It knocked me out, and I would cough up black-looking mucus. My wife was concerned. Was this coincidence? I trusted the Lord for healing and after about six weeks I was fully delivered, but it was a real battle of faith. It was a horrible tenacious attack of Satan, for sickness is an oppression of the devil, Acts 10, 38. I fully believe that I gave place to Satan because I deliberately entertained him in a recording of a seance in my own church. By listening to the workings of Satan on a magnetic tape I was stricken with sickness, even though I was a spirit-filled believer. When Oral Roberts first started praying for the sick by radio, his radio messages and prayers were made on tapes, and many objected saying, how can God's healing power be transmitted through a tape? But it was, and the Holy Spirit would confirm the word preached electronically and people would be healed listening to their radios. In like manner, by the law of opposites, Satan's cursing power can be transmitted electronically. Consider that today the television screens of North America are carrying interviews with witches, seances have even been conducted by radio, and discussions on parapsychology and the occult have been openly made. Can this affect our health if we deliberately look or listen? Certainly. We can be afflicted through the ear gate or the eye gate. Paul distinctly wrote, Neither give place to the devil, Ephesians 4, 27. I believe that I gave my ears and mind to the devil when I listened to the seance recording. I got what I deserved. Some deliberately take university courses on the occult for which they obtain credits. The devotees of the cults are trying to make it a respectable science and make it popular for the masses. In considering the bloodless cults, we find that Mrs. Mary Baker Eddy used to go into trances to get her revelations that she taught under the name, Christian Science. Helena Petrovna, a Russian girl, married N. B. Blavatsky in 1848 and became a spiritist medium. As Madame Blavatsky, she founded the Theosophical Society in New York in 1875. The Unity Church was founded by Franz Anton Mesmer, a German physician who started the practice of mesmerism, a form of hypnosis. Mesmer spoke of his magnetic fluid. It was something that flowed from him. We understand, of course, that this was simply the powerful familiar spirit in him bringing the other person's mind into subjection. Quimby took up his teachings and became a pioneer spiritual healer. Mormonism was started by an illiterate man named Joseph Smith, who claimed to have seen an angel named Moroni who showed him where certain golden plates were buried in New York State. Supernatural ability was supposed to be given to Smith to interpret the hieroglyphics. We do not doubt the appearance of this supernatural being, but as the teachings of Mormonism do not agree with the Word of God, we must assume that it was an evil angel, a deceiving spirit. Smith nearly died afterwards. Jehovah's Witnesses deny the pre-existence of Jesus Christ, and John states positively that this is the teaching of a false prophet when one denies that Jesus came in the flesh as the Son of God in 1 John 4, 1-3. Russellism is anti-Christian by definition. The new cult of Armstrongism is having a revival. It also belongs to the tares of the field, an enemy hath done this, Matthew 13, 28-39. We are in the harvest time of the age, and in the world, all anti-Christian cults are coming to their full fruition, as is also the wheat of Jesus planting. It is a most interesting and challenging age in which to live. These cults are opposed to Jesus Christ and are repulsed by any mention of his blood. They are well described by Paul when writing to Timothy. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, 1 Timothy 4, 1-2. These false cults, which have proliferated like tares, are demonic in origin and teaching. If we give our minds to their evil teachings and practices, we shall receive their spirits which are interwoven in the whole texture of their cults. These are occult societies, with occult spirits operating and hidden from man's view. 
They can only be detected by the discerning of spirits, which is one of the nine charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 8-10. Those who have been enmeshed by these cults can turn to Jesus and ask for His forgiveness and the cleansing of His blood, but they will probably need the strong prayer of exorcism to deliver them from the seducing evil spirit that will almost certainly have been given a home by giving place to the devil. We cannot blame God if we lose our health, our mind, or even our loved ones. Occult involvement is like taking a viper to our bosoms. It will give us the kiss of death. Letters are continually arriving at my office telling of cases of people bound in wheelchairs because their mother or father, or both were involved with occultism in some form or another. The sins of the fathers are indeed visited upon the third and fourth generations of those who disobey God. This warning is given in Exodus 20, 5, in the giving of the Ten Basic Commandments, and it is directly connected with the command forbidding the making of graven images and bowing down and worshipping them. Disobedience on these matters is going straight into Satan's occult camp, and the result will be suffering, sickness, sorrow and despair, and often early death, unto the third and fourth generation, from grandchildren to great-grandchildren. Are you willing to take this risk? There is forgiveness and deliverance in Jesus Christ. He is very merciful toward those that repent of their sins and turn to Him. Open renunciation and repudiation of these occult sins must be made, then forgiveness and cleansing may be received. By faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood, the occult line that has run through a whole family can be broken. Chapter 8 Horoscopes This chapter deals with horoscopes. They should really be called horoscopes, however, for by reading them and digesting their contents, a person opens himself to the horrors of the devil. Most of our newspapers today carry a column dealing with horoscopes, called monthly prognostications in the Bible, and lay out the pretended things that will happen to you each day of the month. This is not a new practice but is as old as mankind. In Daniel's day, he and his friends were included among the wise men who were magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers. Where Jesus is not honored and the presence of the Holy Spirit enjoyed, mankind will automatically degenerate into the negative cycle of dealing with demon powers and inquire of them for information about the future. This is especially done on those days in the monthly calendar which may be considered favorable for certain activities. Astrology must not be confused with the legitimate science of astronomy, the basic idea behind astrology is that the stars themselves influence the conduct of human affairs. The worship of the sun and moon have been with mankind since earliest times. The sun would represent the supreme deity, the moon, a female deity owing her allegiance to the sun god. The stars in their turn became the lesser gods, all of which in the overall picture affected humanity for good or evil. They had to be worshipped and horoscopes had to be made of their prognostications. This is pure heathen practice with the demon gods operating behind the heavenly facade. In 1935 I was employed by a large oil company in London, England, and my boss at the head office informed me one day that he wrote horoscopes. With my history of occult involvement, I became quite enthusiastic and asked him if he would write mine. I got the nearest time and date of my birth this is extremely important, and he made me my very own horoscope. The contents certainly seemed to explain some of the behavior patterns of my life, which were basically known to my boss as well as the demons. It was really quite an intriguing transcript and I showed it to my fiancé, Olive. She agreed it was a fairly accurate portrait of myself. I returned to my boss's office and asked him if he would consider doing a horoscope for my fiancé. At first, he was not too keen because he was a cynic as far as women were concerned, but he finally agreed. I got Olive's time and date of birth as near as we could compute them. My boss wrote the horoscope, which was not as good as mine. Then he cast the two together and rather horrified us with the definite statement that we were not temperamentally suited and should not consider marriage. He assured us it would never work. You can see what you get into when you start inquiring of the devil. 
we both lost confidence in this method of fortune-telling or soothsaying decided to ignore it, and went ahead with our marriage plans anyway. Up to the time of this writing, we have been happily married for thirty-nine years. Both of us have been used of the Lord in the ministry of deliverance, in healing the sick and casting out Satan's demons. Is it possible Satan might have had some precognizance of what would happen to his kingdom if he did not stop us teaming up against him? Precognizance is one of the occult gifts. Clairvoyance is another. Could he have seen, however dimly, what would happen? All we can say is, it is possible. But suppose we had been involved much more deeply in this business of astrology and reading horoscopes? Suppose we had had no faith in God at that time? Thank God we had a little, which seemed to be enough to sustain us and bring us back to realize that anyone who allows their life to be governed by astrology is a fool. We might have been trapped by the lies of the devil. The stars said we must not marry, we were incompatible. But instead of listening to the stars, we listened to God and believed He had brought us together. Olive had prayed most sincerely about our relationship, and when I proposed, she felt a strong pressure from the Holy Spirit to make her accept. How many lives have been ruined by foolish people who listened to the demons behind the horoscopes instead of trusting the Lord who had promised to bless us with uncounted blessings if we served Him? Perhaps the saddest part of this story is that my boss died three years later of a disfiguring cancer of the face. Israel, God's chosen people, his Church of the Old Covenant, went after every type of occult practice they saw among their Gentile neighbors. They learned more easily about other gods than they did about the true God. They and their elders had faithfully promised to have no other gods before Jehovah. In Isaiah 47, 11-14, God lovingly told them what would happen, but they refused to listen. He said, Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, stand up, and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee, behold they, that is, their gods, shall be as stubble, the fire shall burn them, they shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. All the worship of heathen gods, all the money they had poured into the coffers of the heathen temples, all their time and devotion to a lost cause would not save them from total, irrevocable calamity. It happened just as he said it would, and my friend, it will happen to you if you persist in your practice of reading the daily horoscope. My wife was trying to explain to a lady that it was literally playing with death to read horoscopes, but her reply was typical when I come to the part called horoscopes, I just go on reading. It is entertaining and fun. What's the harm anyway? You would have a better chance if you played Russian roulette and had a rattlesnake as a pet, than by dabbling in the forbidden practices of the occult. The hidden demon spirits are lurking to trap you and destroy you. Destroy? How? How can reading a daily horoscope kill me? How can reading tea leaves, reading cards, having my palm read, and carrying a lucky charm hurt me? Friend, it can kill you. We have uncovered time after time that the primary causes of such death-dealing sicknesses as cancer, heart failure, and arthritis had an association in the past with some of these innocent practices. By seeking knowledge from these sources we can open ourselves to demons that may cause arthritis and other crippling diseases. The church has been silent and has not warned people. Ministers of large denominations have even encouraged their members to go to spiritist seances because this proves that life after death exists. They have served on committees for the investigation of psychic phenomena. Healing orders in some Protestant churches have been literally shot through and through with metaphysical teachings and spiritual healing by other means than Jesus Christ. On one occasion I was invited to speak on spiritual healing at a retreat in Ontario, twenty miles north of Toronto. I did my best. I spoke about how Jesus healed and how He was still healing through His servants. I spoke of the power of the blood of Jesus. 
I did not know that the other speaker after me was a Christian spiritualist. In fact, I did not even know that such a creature as a Christian spiritualist existed. I thought they were all of the devil. She relied on a tape recording to give her the right type of music so that she could slip into a trance. When she switched on the tape recorder, it refused to work. Everything was tried, but still, it would not work. Another tape recorder was produced and connected up, but it too failed to work. She was never able to minister. Jesus and his blood had made both tape recorders fail to work. What a good thing the Lord had me bat first. The present outpouring of the Holy Spirit is stirring up the demonic powers to a frenzy, and is flushing out all occultism from its hidden lairs. The same fire of the Holy Spirit will soon begin to burn up their powers, even as it stopped the tape recorders. Jesus prophesied this when he said in Matthew 13, 30 40 that he would send his messengers who would be used to burn up these tares. In the present church renewal, many will be delivered from occult bondages and brought to salvation in Jesus Christ and the subsequent infilling with his Holy Spirit. Instead of trying to be guided by false spirits, many will be guided by the Holy Spirit, who has such gifts of guidance as the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Everything we need to know will be given to anyone who inquires of the Lord. Jesus said, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. John 16, 13. We do not need Satan's lies. We need the truth of God. Chapter 9. There is deliverance. I have tried to show in this book the extreme danger of contamination with occult powers. Man was made by God to have fellowship with Him, to be free, healthy, and wise, but if man will not serve God, then the spiritual vacuum will automatically be filled by Satan. Man is not a completely free agent, but is free to choose. He is made to serve God, but if he will not, he will serve the devil. Paul made this very clear when he wrote, You know well enough that if you put yourselves at the disposal of a master, to obey him, you are slaves to the master whom you obey, and this is true whether you serve sin, with death as its result, or obedience, with righteousness as its result. Romans 6, 16 If God is not your master, then Satan becomes your master. If we obey God, we worship Him because we love Him, but if we do not obey God, we worship Satan, and it is in the various occult forms that we find our spiritual contact with Satan and his demons. This is why Moses instructed Israel to have no other gods before him. The issue is clear. You will either serve God or gods. You will either worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or you will worship Satan and his evil spirits. Satan will serve you, answer your prayers, delude you and finally give you the payoff, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 I have tried to show that the many gods, or demons of Satan manifest his evil in many subtle ways. The moment a person, be he ever so sincere, contaminates himself with occult involvement, be it teacup reading or the grosser forms of spiritist seances, he puts himself in the vulnerable position of being subjected progressively by a demon spirit. This evil spirit will not stop at a small bridgehead, but will progressively work its way into one's mind and body like a steadily growing cancer. As the door of entrance is opened wider, other spirits will also enter, some to give delusions in the mind, others to cause erratic behavior, still, others to visit sickness upon the body. The end result will be progressive degeneration as the unfortunate person gets older, until in their last days they may be totally senile and crippled. Always remember that God's norm is a long life with abundance and satisfaction. Psalms 91, 16 God gives regeneration, not degeneration. Regeneration is not only a fact at our spiritual rebirth. John 3, 3-5, but it is a progressive daily experience. 
It is a fact that many who become Christians by the rebirth do indeed find their health progressively improves over the years. This has been true in my own case. What can we do for these millions of people, many professing Christians, who have contaminated themselves with the demons behind the many occult mysteries? Can we find healing for them to rid them of their infestations? Yes, in Acts 10, 38 we are told that Jesus, anointed of the Holy Spirit, went around among the people healing all that were oppressed by the devil. This means that he took the people from their spiritual subjection and brought them out into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. Romans 8, 21 The word oppressed means to be overpowered or overcome, in other words to be brought to a place of captivity and bondage, as in a prison. Jesus came to set us free, for, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8, 36 In recent years in the present charismatic move of God among the churches, the deliverance ministry has arisen. It has been found that when Christians take their rightful authority in Christ against sin, sickness, and suffering and openly rebuke it in His name, the demons behind the troubles react and come out, often quite violently as we read in Mark 1, 25, and 26. This is frequently a very astonishing experience and will increase your faith in God and His Word tremendously. The number now who are using this forceful and scriptural approach in prayer is rapidly increasing, in spite of opposition by some fearful people. This is the day of the revelation of God's power that was manifest in the life of Jesus when He went around delivering the captives and setting them free. The concept that emotional problems and physical bondages can actually be precipitated by occult involvement is so alien to Christian thinking that it is hard for people to understand. Of course, we know that psychiatry and the medical profession know nothing about these dangers or the causes. This is a brand new field of understanding and healing. It is a fulfillment of the words of Jesus who referred to the prophecy of Isaiah, He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4, 18 Priests of heathen religions will explain to visitors from western countries that there are spirits behind their idols, and it is the spirits who answer their prayers. The average tourist may think this is funny or just superstitious foolishness of ignorant people, but it happens to be dreadfully and fearfully true. We have shown that not only are demons behind idols, but in Asian temples, there are holes in the back of some of their hideous monstrosities which the demon uses to go in and out. He goes in when some sacrifice or oblation is made to him. We have shown that demons can inhabit the physical matter of these idols. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is likened to water, because water is fluid, and evil spirits are likewise fluid and will actually flow over us and into us if we give them place. Give no place to the devil, Paul said in Ephesians 4, 27. If we do, we actually create a hole into which Satan can flow by his spirits. As the pure water of the Holy Spirit can flow in and out of us in the operation of charismatic gifts. John 7, 38 so likewise unclean spirits can flow in and out of us and manifest their filth in false prophecies, false teachings, and evil speakings. When people visit us for special prayer at our Toronto church, we ask them if they have had any form of occult involvement, a surprisingly large number realize that they have been involved in such things in times past. Due to ignorance of parents and friends, Many have been seduced into communicating with demons, from the amusing Ouija board to the equally entertaining Chinese fortune cookies given us when we eat Chinese food. Horoscopes have been read as well as books about the occult religions of unity, theosophy, parapsychology, etc. Many have drawn into their minds evil thoughts from evil personalities, and the inevitable mental or physical bondage has caused many people to come seeking prayer. However, Prayer is ineffectual unless the cause is understood, confessed, and forsaken. Resentments, criticisms, and pride must also be confessed, brought out into the open, and then forsaken as something hideous and unclean. 
Forgiveness must be sought from the Savior and the cleansing of His blood applied. The occult line can then be quickly broken, the continuing curse in our life can be lifted, and we can be set free as the demons are commanded to come out in Jesus' name. To do business with Satan as a master may be entertaining for a while. The trinity of Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil may appear to satisfy for a season, but what a collective price we pay for this style of life. It has been my privilege in recent times to pray for quite a few young witches, who at first certainly did not appear to be full of evil, but through time even their very faces would be changed, and their bodies might even become twisted because of twisted minds. In all cases, the demons quickly responded. In some sessions of prayer, the demons threw their subject to the floor and sometimes spoke back, but finally came out, screaming and coughing, being ejected through the witch's throat. The longer a young witch practices her evil ways, the greater will be the control that the familiar spirits exercise over her. The older the witch, the more violent the deliverance because compound troubles may have occurred. Our young people go in for the occult because they say it gives them power over their peers. True, it does. When Philip came to Samaria in Acts 8, he exercised a much greater power than that of Simon the sorcerer. Previous to Philip's visit, the whole city believed that Simon had the ultimate in power. He bewitched the people with his sorceries. But when Philip's power was manifest, Simon quickly saw that his power was less than Philip's, and he attempted to buy it with money. When we minister deliverance to witches and spiritists, we always lead them to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit afterwards. As they begin to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. Acts 2, 1-4 A stronger power flows through them, a power that can heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. If you are looking for power, the Holy Spirit can give you the power you need. All people need power. All people crave power. This is why an unbeliever seeks self-aggrandizement and works himself to death, trying to be top dog. But when God makes you a son, He gives you the potential to act like a son and do the works of the Son of God. You can have His power over sin, sickness, and evil in any form. You can have power over evil men and those who would attack you. You can sit in the driver's seat, the seat of authority in Christ. You can become the head and not the tail. You can have the dynamic power which He gives to those who ask Him. Acts 1, 8 If you have been involved in any form of the forbidden occult, confess it and contact someone in your area who can pray the commanding prayer of faith that will set you free. Start afresh with Jesus the Son of God, and go out and do His works. John 14, 12 This is the day of the full restoration of the body of Christ. In my name shall they cast out devils. Mark 16, 17 Jesus promised you. Chapter 10 God's Alternative Not only does occult involvement lead to sickness, slavery, and death, it is also unnecessary. There is no reason to seek power and knowledge from Satan, since the Lord provides everything we need. Indeed, His provision for us is greater than we can possibly imagine. Jesus told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In this triad, we have the recipe for a life of dominion over the world, the flesh, and the devil. There is not a created being, be it an elephant or a germ, that can harm one of us, unless we permit it to harm us by lack of faith. Once we fully understand the authority vested in us by God through Christ, we can proceed to take our place as invincible creatures of faith, and not conquerable captives of fear. Paul wrote, We are more than conquerors through Christ. Not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors. Jesus is the way out of our captivity, our bondage, our sorrows, our feebleness. He blazed a trail clean out of captivity. He was manifest and anointed with the Holy Spirit at Jordan that He might bind up the broken-hearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, open the prison doors to those who are bound in chains, and set them free. 
this fullness of salvation does not have to be repeated. We are saved, and set free once and for all, that we might enjoy a fullness of blessing in this kingdom of God on earth, restored paradise indeed. The salvation of the soul is the way into the new life, with healing of the mind and body, so that we might enjoy divine health and strength. The prison door is not open that we might come out one day and go back in a week's time because we got so used to being cared for by the devil. It was said that many Negroes who were emancipated in the days of Abraham Lincoln continued to work for their old masters, rather than venture forth into an unknown world. Truly the kingdom of God is an unknown world to most people, and unfortunately so few Christians today have much idea of the blessing given by Jesus to us on the cross. They would rather live like other church-going people, than begin to act as sons of God, royalty indeed. Being of the royal family of God sets them too far apart from even members of their own families, who remain in sin and ignorance. They dare not be different. However, the Bible teaches us that we are different, completely different, and separate from the world. It is as we learn to live and act differently that we begin to have experiences of divine power and authority and blessing that amaze us, and demonstrate God's glory. Jesus said I am the truth. Once we have accepted the way, we must walk in the light as He is in the light. 1 John 1, 7 we no longer walk by traditions taught to us by others, even if these traditions sounded sensible, and were taught by church leaders. In Jesus' day there were many rabbis, and a powerful church, but he said they had made the word of God of no effect by their traditions. This means in plain language, they had thrown the book out of the window. They had church, ceremonies, religion, priests, services, but no truth. Once a son of God enters the kingdom of God, he must adjust his life, his thinking, his speech, his bearing, and realize that perfect love casteth out all fear. What a challenge! The more our lives become readjusted to his truth, the more authority we will exercise over Satan. Though all men may laugh at you, it is better to obey God than man. Jesus said I am the life. Christianity is not a monastic life suppressing natural desires and appetites. It is a life of abundance for spirit, soul, and body. Jesus said that He came to give life and to give it more abundantly. He came to take that tired, bound, captive life and fill it with His overwhelming abundance. Can we imagine Adam being sick, depressed, miserable, weak, and fearful in the garden? Jesus came to give us back everything that Adam lost, and as we shall see, even more under the new covenant in his blood. Abundant life means just what it says for every child of God, everyone who approaches the mercy seat will have available to him immediately every blessing in the Bible, and there are thousands. Abundant life, including joy, peace, strength, health, and prosperity is laid to your account in heaven by Jesus Christ. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19 Unfortunately, when a child of God does venture into the bank of heaven, after knocking timorously, instead of walking in boldly as if he owned the place, and he does. He cautiously and apologetically approaches one of the tellers, and proffers a check with a small amount and wonders whether it will be honored. This is not an exaggeration concerning the approach in prayer of the average child of God. We might just as well write million as two because it belongs to an heir of God anyway. Let us, therefore, go boldly into the holiest place by a new and living way, and plead the blood of Jesus as our reason for expecting fantastic blessings. The world uses the word pay off. Our pay off includes every good thing the moment we dare to enjoy it by faith. The blood of Jesus purchased every redemptive blessing for us. But I am not worthy of His blessings. Who said so? The opposite is the truth, this is a lie of Satan. Thou hast a few names. Which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelation 3, 4. Jesus makes us worthy in Him. 
As long as we abide in Him, and permit His words to abide in us, then we will continue to be worthy of all His abundant blessings. Though these wonderful blessings have been made available to us at the cross, yet each promise must be appropriated by our own personal faith, and not that of another, no promise of God is automatically bestowed on us. It must be appropriated by faith. The story is told of a soldier son who faithfully sent his uneducated mother a monthly check, enough to keep her in comfort, health, and happiness. The mother could not read, and so she received her son's letters, but did not understand what the check was, and so over a period of years she used to stuff the money under her mattress. She died in abject poverty, bringing early death upon herself because of lack of proper food. Had she not the means? Were not the checks good? Was not the son faithful in all that he did? Had she understood the ways of the bank and of her son, she need not have died in misery. She was worthy for she was his mother. We are worthy of these blessings because we are sons. Many Christians have failed to appreciate the significance of their sonship, and have believed that Jesus only vested his authority in the twelve apostles. It is true that these men were the foundation stones of the New Testament church, and they were built upon Jesus, the cornerstone. However, the church, the body of Christ, is composed of many members, and these are supposed to exercise his authority each day in their own lives, so that the church shall arrive at a point of having no spot or wrinkle, no sickness or disease, no defeat or frustration, and no oppression of Satan. We are told to go on unto perfection. Before Jesus left this earth he gave a last commission to his church, which was not a limited dispensational commission, but binding for the whole Christian age or dispensation, which ceases only at his second coming. In Matthew 28, 18 Jesus told his disciples that he had been given all power in heaven and upon earth. He had earned this power by his death and the shedding of his blood. The whole power of the universe was vested in one man who rose from the dead. Because of the death of the testator, the new covenant came into operation, as in the case of common earthly testaments, or wills. God in Christ died, reconciling the world unto himself, and in this manner was the new covenant ushered in when Jesus shed his blood and gave up the Spirit on the cross, crying, It is finished. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17. Because God died in the person of Christ, it became legally possible for his Son to possess all things, and because he possessed them. He had a free hand to give them to whomever he wished. It was this thought that was no doubt in his mind when he gave seventy men his power, for it was his to give by right of sacrifice. When they dared to use it in faith, it worked. This should not surprise any of us, for we have a demonstration of higher authority every day in the police force of any nation or city. When the policeman holds up his hand in traffic, the vehicles grind to a halt, because the authority of the head of state is vested in that policeman's hand. In the British Commonwealth, that authority belongs to the Queen or King, and is known as the authority of the Crown. When we accept Jesus as Saviour, we accept the authority of the Crown, for we are a royal priesthood. We are kings and priests, we are of royal family, we enforce the law of Calvary. His crown covers our authority and when we hold up our hands before all the might of Satan, he also must grind to a complete stop. Indeed, we can give Satan a ticket. It is in keeping with the gospel that we should all understand that we have his authority and that we can use it today. These signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mark 16, 16-18 To whom do they refer? To those who believe and are baptized, every child of God born into the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit. The same authority that was vested in the seventy is now vested in all who believe. Hallelujah! We are to cast out demons, heal the sick and handle serpents as harmless things, just as Moses handled a serpent in Exodus 4, 4. Moses' ministry was to deliver the people, 
and the ministry of Jesus was also to deliver the people, and he handed on his mantle to the church on the day of Pentecost, to continue the same ministry that the people might be delivered today. Let my people go, is still God's cry to us today. Are we doing it, or making excuses? We have the authority and the power, all that is now required is that we should go forward and use it. Jesus gives us a parable in Luke 11, 21-22. He speaks of a strong man being armed and keeping his palace. Satan is this strong man, and he is described as the prince, or ruler, of this present world in which we live. He certainly does a good job at keeping this world bound in sin, sickness, sorrow, and suffering. But Jesus said that when a stronger man comes, he binds the strong man and delivers him of his captives and takes his house and possessions. Jesus did this at Calvary, and he hands on the keys of the kingdom to all who will take them and go into Satan's strongholds to set the people free. Greater is he who is in you than he Satan, who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Tremendous Truths. We do not call on Jesus to do this for us, this is apologetic unbelief, for He is in us, and so we go forward in Him and do it in His name. Jesus did not tell His disciples to pray for Him to heal the sick or cast out devils, no, for we read, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. We are on the receiving end to give to those who are in need. As we hold on to the right hand of the Lord who got the victory, then we take from Him the healings, deliverances, and blessings which He commands us to give to the people. When Jesus fed the five thousand, He broke the bread and gave it to the disciples, but they in turn gave to the hungry. Give ye them to eat, still echoes from heaven today. We do not try to be religious and kneel down and piously ask Him to do the giving for us. This is unbelief in action. We take and we give, and there will be many basketfuls left over after our ministry, so that we have a never-decreasing supply to give to everyone who is hungry for God and His blessings. While we are busy giving bread, we can eat as much as we like ourselves, so both the giver and the receiver get blessed, healed, restored, and caused to prosper don't limit God. This was why Israel failed to go into a land that flowed with milk and honey. They limited God. In Psalm 1, in simple language, we are told that a child of God will prosper in everything that he does. This means material prosperity, mental and emotional prosperity, and spiritual prosperity. We shall have had supplied to us all things needful from the bank of heaven. This is a land that flows with milk and honey, so much milk and so much honey that the crews of God's blessings will never dry up, the barrel of meal will never cease to supply our needs. Whatever we do shall prosper. But we have to keep ourselves planted by the river of life that flows through the paradise of God. We must feed upon Him who died for us. And so the disciples went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Mark 16, 20. Notice the gospel ends with Amen, which means so let it be. God desires that He should be given an opportunity to do His part by confirming His word that is preached by us. These signs will be the casting out of demons, the healing of the sick, and taking dominion over every evil sin and sickness and handling them as dead serpents and scorpions. We preach, and the signs will follow. Amen. Chapter 11. Joint Heirs. To appreciate fully the incredible blessings which we receive from God through Jesus Christ, we consider the amazing teachings of the Apostle Paul in his famous eighth chapter of Romans. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In Greek, huios, mature sons. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bearing witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. In Greek, 
technon, newborn ones, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 14-17 Paul starts by telling us that as mature sons of God we can be led of His Holy Spirit. This is quite different from being led of the wisdom of man, for being led of the Holy Spirit is the daily experience of a son of God who has grown out of the milk stage to the meat stage. God expects us to be led of His Spirit, which is a continual operation of the gifts of the Spirit in our daily lives. He then proceeds by explaining that if we have fear, we did not get it from God. It is an evil spirit, a demon, sent of Satan, but not of God. What God gives us is the Holy Spirit that adopts us into His family. Just as a natural-born child and a legally adopted child in a family would have the same name, the same privileges, the same standard of living, the same education, and finally would share together in the estate of the Father, in like manner we are adopted into the family of God. Jesus becomes our elder brother, and He is the only begotten of the Father. But although He is the begotten Son, and we are adopted out of every tongue, tribe, and race on earth, we still become sons of God and are reckoned to have all the privileges, all the favors, all the blessings that belong by legal right to the Son of God. He does not withhold anything from those that walk uprightly. He is more anxious to bestow His favors upon us than we are to receive them. We cannot imagine or understand such blessings, such prosperity, and such health. We are as one in a dream, but the Word of God is true, if children, then heirs of God. As Jesus became the rightful possessor of all His Father's estate, so also do we become heirs of this estate through faith in Christ. We become heirs of the same estate that was given to Jesus because He was obedient unto the death of the cross. He paid for all these blessings in His own blood. They are His and they are ours. Does He share them with us? No. They are just as much ours as His. Now we find we have become joint heirs with Christ. A joint heir is one who has as much right to the estate as the other joint heir. Now notice that it does not matter how many children apply for the blessing of this New Testament estate, for the riches in glory never dry up, and to borrow from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the more we give away, the more we have. There is room at the cross for you, my friend, even though millions have already come. You will never exhaust the riches of glory. They are unlimited. Jesus has taught us that He inherited all things in heaven and in earth. All power is His, the silver, the gold, the cattle, all are His by right of inheritance, because the testator died, thus establishing, ratifying, and probating the New Testament. All the promises of the Old and New Testaments are ours today and forever. He does not share or give us handouts. He is the good shepherd of the sheep, and we can go in and out and find pasture, knowing the wolf shall not touch us. He is our brother, we are his brethren. What is his is ours, and all we have to give is ourselves, and he multiplies our station, our prosperity, and makes us into kings and priests. From commoners to royalty in one rebirth, no wonder so many find it hard to appreciate such riches and such glory. It seems to take us all so many years to begin to lay hold on this prosperity, we are so used to being stupid, and fearful, and poor, that it takes time to realize what the expression, riches of grace really means. Some may argue that these promises are only to make us spiritually rich, but physically poor. Let us remind you that Jesus told us He became poor to make many rich. 2 Corinthians 6, 10 We must be careful not to seek riches as an end, but to seek only Jesus and His righteousness, and He will become our prosperity in spirit, soul, and body. We shall lack nothing, and this is riches indeed. Let us not indulge again in apologetic, but enter into His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. John knew this when he wrote, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. David, in Old Testament times, put no division between the blessings of soul and body health. We have two feet to tread upon the two curses of Satan, 
the scorpion of sin and the serpent of sickness. Bless the Lord O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Psalm 103, 2, and 3. His power and authority are sufficient, for if he puts all things under his feet, then they are under ours also. For our feet become his feet on earth, and our hands his hands, for our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit through which God wishes to manifest the Son by the Holy Spirit in us. The amazing truth of our adoption is given a double witness in Galatians 4. Paul begins by reminding us that we were under bondage before we found liberty in Christ, but Jesus redeemed us, or purchased us from this bondage into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. It was as if we were slaves to Satan. Jesus came and paid the price of his own blood and we were set free from the power of Satan, for, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thus a complete freedom from want, fear, poverty, suffering, and sickness was given to us as a free gift, and is called the good news of the kingdom of God. Good news indeed. 100% free. The redemption price at Calvary introduced the law of adoption. By believing with our whole hearts that Jesus paid the penalty of our sins, we were reckoned to have been adopted by God into his family. We may not have been aware of this, nor of the amazing blessings that accrue to us, but God reckoned it nevertheless, and it is as we become aware of this truth that we enter into a progressively greater degree of blessing as we exercise our faith, and our faith comes through reading and believing the Word of God. Paul concludes, therefore, by telling us that we are no more servants, but sons, and if sons, then heirs of God through Christ. It is all through our elder brother. Now notice the tremendous change that takes place when Jesus incorporates us into his royal family. No longer a little below the angels, but now lifted up into heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 2, 6. It is always necessary to remember that as we abide in Christ, we are where He is. He is the new creation, and we also are reckoned to be a new creation in Him. If He is far above all principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. Ephesians 1, 21, then we also are positionally the same when we learn to abide in Him. No wonder Jesus told His disciples that they had power over all the power of Satan. Jesus obtained that power through the cross, and now we are joint heirs with Him in His reigning position on the right hand of God, set down in heavenly places. This truth is so amazing, that it alarms the timid who think more of their unworthiness than His worthiness. Worthy is the Lamb, the angels cried. Paul understood this truth when he reminded us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. Ephesians 6, 12. In this verse are enumerated the various degrees of satanic spiritual wickedness. These are not earthly powers, they are satanic spiritual powers that control earthly kingdoms, dictatorships, political systems, and religious systems opposed to God. Every evil, foul demon working for Satan is mentioned in the categories, now Paul says we wrestle with them. Is this a hopeless wrestling match? Are the odds 100 to 1 against us? Do we go into the ring doomed to be pulverized by these powers? No, a thousand times no. We go in to win, to defeat the enemy by commanding, by prayer, by our very attitude of victory. The very moment Satan sees us enter the ring, he knows that he is defeated. He will certainly put up stiff and stubborn opposition, but he knows he is defeated, and it is only a matter of time before he will throw in the towel, and declare that he can no longer oppress us in the way he tried so hard to do. Our faith must never waver. The battle may be long and fierce, but, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Defeat is not in the dictionary of heaven unless it speaks of Satan and his demons. For the Christian, there is only victory. Why is this? It is because our lives are hid in Christ, and the wicked one touches us not. 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When ministering in Uruapan, Mexico, we met a Christian man who was a cotton grower with a farm given to him by the Mexican government. The surrounding cotton farmers resented his faith, for they were fanatical religionists being stirred up by their priests. They commanded this man to leave his farm, and he refused. They came again and ordered him to run and that they would shoot him. He refused to run and told them he would stay where God had put him. Then an enraged fanatic said he would shoot him where he stood, so he said, Go ahead and shoot, but I'm not quitting, at which a strange thing happened, the man began to tremble violently and he turned and slunk away. This is a true story, for the man gave me his sombrero as a memento of a New Testament story. Resist the devil steadfastly in the faith. Sometimes we do not wrestle long enough. We give up and Satan wins, whereas he was only supposed to lose and run. We once had an objection raised to this teaching of our authority in Christ. How could we command Satan when even the great and mighty Archangel Michael dare not rebuke Satan himself, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Jude 9. This is a wonderful and marvelous revelation. Before Calvary man had been created in God's likeness, but a little lower than the angels, including Michael the Archangel, but after Calvary, we were elevated far above all principalities and powers. Now an angel becomes a ministering spirit to those who are heirs of this salvation. This is where our position of being joint heirs with Christ is rightly understood. Now Michael and other angels become our ministering spirits, now we are recreated in Christ to be above them, not a little lower, but now far above. As Michael never sinned, he was never lost, and so does not need a Savior. It was the fallen angels who sinned, and were divested of their spiritual bodies and position. They were cast out into the earth. Revelation 12, 9, and 10. But Michael is still an archangel and is still subject to obedience of rank. Satan was created the greatest and the most powerful of all the angels, and Michael was next in rank with others like Gabriel. Therefore Michael could not rebuke his superior officer, even if his superior officer had sinned. He still carries his rank, for the callings of God are not to be repented of. He now uses this rank to break down God's heritage instead of helping to build it up by ministering to it, as Michael does. Satan was created as the supreme commander-in-chief of all angelic forces. Before the cross, he even entered heaven to give an account of himself as we read in Job 1 and 2, and he correctly reported that he was walking to and fro in the earth, for that was his domain, as prince of this world. At the cross, Satan fell heavily and lost his right of entry into heaven, but he never lost his rank. Luke 10, 18 Michael cannot rebuke Satan, but Jesus did, so we can do so today in his name. This is why we cast out demons in the name of Jesus, we heal the sick in the name of Jesus, we can do all things in the name of Jesus, even commanding a mountain to be cast into the sea, and if we do not doubt in our hearts, it will happen. Try it and see. Thus we find in God's word that he is imploring us to understand our high calling in Christ. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us ward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, name, and hath put all things under his feet. Ephesians 1, 17-22 This is the position of Jesus Christ today. God put him there after he raised him from the dead, and as we abide in him, and are found in him. Philippians 3, 9 We can exercise all the power and authority that he vests in us, his brothers and sisters. In Romans 8, 11 Paul records that if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, 
He that raised up Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. The quickening power of the Holy Spirit will be continually restoring our mortal body to health and strength for every time of need in our victorious battle against Satan. Finally, when it is God's time, and not Satan's time, for us to go to be with the Lord, He will quicken our bodies so completely that we will have a body which is from heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. Every punch that Satan might put into us, in suffering, sickness, frustration, and sorrow, if resisted will be repulsed by the quickening power of the Spirit of God in our mortal bodies. Perhaps this is what Paul had in mind when he wrote that if a believer speaks in tongues he edifies himself, for in so doing he would cause the Spirit of God to move mightily in his mortal body. Paul also recommended to Timothy that he stir up the gift that was in him. Christians today have been far more prone to let the devil stir them up and kick them around, and stamp on them, rather than to take the initiative and stir up the Holy Spirit in themselves, charging into Satan like a quarterback and knocking him down and casting him out of the way. It may seem a crude thing to say, but either Satan is going to kick you around, or you are going to kick him around. Just choose which position you want to play.